Since I'm running for president of the United States, I want to share with you a piece of my fundamental philosophy of governance. Right now, an extremely important case is awaiting decision by the Supreme Court. It's called Murthy versus Missouri. Basically, it's about whether the government can outsource censorship to social media platforms. We now know that both the Trump and Biden administrations leaned on Twitter and Facebook to force them remove or suppress specific people and posts that question government policies. Both Presidents Trump and Biden set up an entire system to funnel censorship requests from government agencies to those platforms. An entire army of agencies had access to the White House's censorship portal, including the CIA, the FBI, the IRS, the CDC, and White House political directors. All of them were censoring information that was factually accurate, but nevertheless inconvenient to the Trump and Biden administrations, which did not want the public to know the truth. I have a special interest in this case because I was one of the first people censored, and I was also one of the original plaintiffs who brought the suit in the first place. That's because the White House was ordering social media platforms to censor me, despite the fact that everything I posted was factually accurate, and cited to peer-reviewed publications or government databases. But there's a lot more at stake here than my own constitutional rights. This case is about the kind of nation that we want to live in. Unfortunately, democracy alone is not enough to guarantee our freedoms. We now know that democratically elected governments are perfectly willing to take away our rights if they think that they can get away with it. That's why the founders put constitutional limits on what the government can and cannot do. And the most important of all these limits is the First Amendment guarantee of freedom of speech. A government that can silence its critics has license for any atrocity, including the suppression of all of our other constitutional rights. Without free speech, none of our freedoms will last very long. Remember, both President Trump and President Biden, Republicans and Democrats have all failed to safeguard this most basic freedom. That changes the moment I become president. If you share that priority, then please help me get elected by donating to my campaign today. Let's discuss this and much more with a main player in shaping our potential future, independent presidential candidate, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. It's good to see you, sir. Thanks for having me back, Chris. So, you have had a dance when it comes to saying things on Twitter or on the internet that people don't want you to say and uh, things being restricted or shadow banned or whatever you want. What do you think people need to understand about the state of play with where law and culture should meet on what's being called content moderation on social media? Well, the, you know, I have a case now in, that just won in the Court of Appeals. Uh, called Biden, Biden versus Kennedy, Kennedy versus Biden, where I su successfully sued the president for uh, uh, for censoring, for ordering the social media sites to censor me and to deplatform me. Thirty-seven hours after he took the oath of office, swearing to uphold the Constitution of the United States, President Biden had people within his White House staff contacting Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, Google, the other social media sites, and pressuring them to remove my uh, posts. And, and my posts, you know, they said originally, well, they're, it's because he's posting misinformation, but they were not able to point to a single post that I had posted that was actually factually er erroneous, and they had to make up a new word called malinformation, which is information that is accurate, but is nevertheless inconvenient to the government. And so they were, you had the U.S. government doing something unprecedented, which is to, uh, which is to pressure social media right. sites, media sites to, to, to censor political I speech. I put up the and tweet what it was wrong. for people, no, you know, uh, Bobby, just, just for people at home. One, Bobby's referring to what this case is yeah. before the Supreme Court right now, what the line is between persuasion and coercion. And here is his... Uh, tweet. Now, look, the criticism uh, is uh, that Hank Aaron's family said it wasn't about COVID, his death, that it was natural causes. 
Um, but be that as it may, whether it's right or wrong, it's about whether the idea has a right to be aired and vetted by the public or not. Uh, do you believe there should be any limitations beyond what is already legal, like kitty porn? Well, I don't think the government should be involved. You know, the social media sites are are welcome to have uh, have uh, programs or processes or community rules Before. that uh, that where they can censor stuff. But once the government gets involved, then the First Amendment is implicated. Um, and you know what the government was doing with the social media sites is it was threatening. To revoke their Section 230 protection, as you pointed out, Section right. 230. If you, if if I come on your show, Chris, and I say something defamatory about somebody, that person can sue not just me but your television show. Oh, right. Or when I when I publish something in the New York Times, every time I publish something, a lot of lawyers would come in and vet it, and I'd spend an hour or two on the phone just for an 800 word op ed. So the social media sites, you know, when they, they, when it was evolving, when the legislation was being passed, said, we can't do that. We cannot have lawyers vet every single post that goes up on our site. Right. And Congress agreed, and they said, you're not that guy, you're a carrier. So we're right. going to give you immunity where you can still sue the person who defamed you, but you cannot sue the company. Well, what the Biden administration was doing was it was saying to Mark Zuckerberg and others, we are going to revoke that protection. And and Mark Zuckerberg said, yeah, that would be existential for us. It would destroy our company. So, you know, of course, the, the uh, social media sites are going to do what they say. Now, social right. media sites ought to be able to police their sites, to take off kiddie porn, to take off uh, uh, right. advo advocates of violence or racism or whatever. Uh, but once the government gets involved and tells them what to do, then, you know, we have a First Amendment problem, and Very that should different. never happen. Hey, thank you for watching. Please go to NewsNationNow.com, NewsNationNow.com, and you can find NewsNation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button down below. Then you will get more of NewsNation's fact-driven coverage. Our founding mission here at the University of Austin is the fearless pursuit of truth. It's our great pleasure then to welcome two remarkable individuals into our community tonight who are renowned for their fearlessness in pursuing truth. Nadine Strossen has for some time been a great friend of the University of Austin. She's a member of our Board of Advisors and she's also on the Board of Advisors for FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Ms. Strossen is a past national president of the American Civil Liberties Union. She's a leading expert and frequent commentator on constitutional law and civil liberties. And she's testified before Congress on multiple occasions. She serves on the advisory boards of the ACLU, Heterodox Academy, and the National Coalition Against Censorship. She's also the author of Hate, Why We Should Resist It With Free Speech, Not Censorship. The National Law Journal has named Ms. Strossen one of America's 100 most influential lawyers. And joining Ms. Strossen on the platform tonight is Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. Mr. Kennedy is running to be President of the United States. <laughs> Mr. Kennedy's political lineage needs no explanation, but it is worth honoring that he himself chose to continue his family's legacy of public service by devoting himself not at first to politics, but to environmental causes and children's welfare. Mr. Kennedy is the founder of the Waterkeeper Alliance, the world's largest clean water advocacy group, and served as its longtime chairman and attorney. He founded Children's Health Defense to combat chronic childhood disease and toxic exposures. For his efforts in restoring the Hudson River, he was named by Time magazine as its hero of the planet. Among his published books are two New York Times bestsellers, Crimes Against Nature and The Real Anthony Fauci. But he is also the author of children's books on American history, two children's books on American history and a third book on St. Francis of Assisi. Mr. Kennedy, is a graduate of Harvard University, the London School of Economics, the University of Virginia Law School, 
and Pace University School of Law. Tonight, Ms. Strossen and Mr. Kennedy are going to engage in a conversation on free speech, civil discourse, and debate in a healthy democracy. At the conclusion of their conversation, we will be open for Q&A. Please again state your name in full, and, and then I will ask you to state a concise question. Ms. Strossen, uh, it's a very warm welcome back to the university for you here tonight. And Mr. Kennedy, sir, it's a real honor for us to welcome you here for the first time. Thank you very much, and enjoy the conversation. Thank you so much, Ben and Bobby. It's nice to be in conversation with you again. The last time I had that honor and pleasure was last summer in Memphis at the Freedom Fest. And there, our subject, and we were joined by the journalist Matt Taibbi, our subject was also freedom of speech. So obviously, this is a topic that is of great concern to you. Uh, can you tell us why? Uh, well, uh, freedom of speech, you know, uh, Hamilton, Madison, Adams said that they put freedom of speech in the First Amendment of the Constitution because all of the other rights depended on it. A government that has the capacity to silence its opponents uh, has the power to commit any kind of atrocity. And we saw during COVID that, you know, beginning around uh, in uh, late January, early February, the government began actively promoting the censorship of speech on the social media. And was, that was something new in the American experience. And I just uh, won a case against President Biden because of, of what he did during that period, Biden versus Kennedy, which is now about to go to the uh, US Supreme Court. Um, but as soon as they figured out that we were going to put up with that, that there was no uproar in the media, they did go after all of the other rights in the Constitution. Um, they, they closed down every business in this country uh, with no due process, no just compensation in violation of the Fifth Amendment. They, um, they went after the other two planks of the First Amendment, they, which were the first one after freedom of speech and freedom of worship, they shut down every church in our country, again, with no scientific citation, no environmental impact statement, no due process, uh, no public hearings, no notice and comment rulemaking, all of the, all of the, uh, the safeguards of the democratic process that I've sued for 40 years. I've litigated on those issues when government and agencies and corporations failed to go through that process. And in this case, there was nothing you could do about it because it was all protected by Operation Warp Speed, by the PREP Act, by the CARES Act. Well, if, um, Bobby, if I can interject, um, because we do want to focus on First Amendment, and you have emphasized uh, not only freedom of speech, but other First Amendment issues, in addition to the social media pressures that have been exerted by this administration, were also uh, exerted by the prior administration. Um, what about the other kinds of attacks that we're seeing on free speech, including here in Texas, that are of special concern to those of us involved in education? Um, attacks on what can be taught in the curriculum, attacks on what books can be included in libraries. In Texas, there was a, a threat to do away with tenure for uh, university professors. Are these kinds of issues of concern to you as well? I mean, any kind of constriction. I'm a free speech absolutist. Oh, I, any kind of constriction on free speech to me is a concern. I mean, the, the legal redress is another question. The, the rules for public universities are very different than private universities. Mm -hmm. Public universities are cannot violate the First Amendment, at least technically, whereas a private university has the right to do anything that it wants. You know, it can, uh, it can prescribe a uh, certain behavior, it can prescribe anything it wants. If you go to the private university, you're joining a private club, and 
I mean, one thing they can't do is they can't allow um, attacks on one ethnic group and then uh, and that, and and what they may, they can't protect one ethnic group or one uh, sexual gender from attack and not protect others. That would subject them to litigation. Um, also, private individuals could sue them uh, for not creating a safe environment and all that in, in a, because you sign a contract. So there's a contractual right. Um, with a public university, you can't do censorship, but there are some, there are some limitations on that because the federal funding, there are, there are HHS regulations, Department of Ed Education regulations, that say the universities that accept federal funding have to um, avoid uh, any kind of a, a, a creating an, a, a, an environment where, uh, at, where there are attacks on, on, uh, on gays, on- Hostile environment harassment. Hostile environment, et cetera. So that actually is protected speech. You know, protected speech, all speech is protected unless it actually incites violence. You can advocate violence. You can say, um, you know, you can say that uh, that all blacks should die. That would be protected speech. You can't say, "Let's kill this particular black person." You know, they kind that of would be that would not be protected by the First Amendment. Yeah. So, you know, uh, that that's the extreme. Right. Right. You know, the, um, some people have proposed that, uh, similar to the limit on fe the condition on federal funding, that universities may not tolerate a hostile environment harassment. There have been proposals that uh, federal funding should also be conditioned on universities protecting free speech and academic freedom. Do you think that's a good idea? Uh, I like that idea. Okay. I think, you know, I think the university should be an ecosystem where there's where there's no holes barred, where everything can be discussed. Exactly, and so even though private universities have no constitutional obligation to protect free speech, many of us think it's a very good idea for them to do that, and most private universities choose to do that because of the educational value. And that brings me to this wonderful inaugural debate that we just saw uh, of the Austin Union. And the mission statement of the Austin Union, I'm gonna quote from it, is to bring true debate back to the forefront of American universities as a way to widen, test, and refine our perceptions of truth. Uh, it then goes on to say that for many, especially outside of academia, debate is a lost art. Um, so I'd like to ask you, Bobby, what is the art of debate? And do you agree that it's, it's a lost art, not only on campus, but in our society and in our political community? Um, I think it's not practiced as much as it used to be. Even when I was growing up, it was, you know, there were famous debates on Capitol Hill. My uncle took part of them. My father took part of my, um, my uncle John Kennedy and Ted Kennedy, who was in the Senate for 50 years. Um, you know, the, I, I, I would say the kind of template for the great debates, political debates that we had in this country were the Lincoln-Douglas debates and um, and, and, you know, and some of the debate, the other presidential debates in our history, which were wonderful, wonderful exercises in uh, a clash of ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I, a lot of the, what people think of the debate now is more like name calling mm -hmm. and shouting people down. And then there's a lot of cancel culture taking mm -hmm. place, which I think inhibits debate and, you know, or, there was an idea at the, during the framing of the Constitution that the, 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 the framers understood that totalitarian systems had a big advantage over democracies because they were much more efficient, in the short term at least. Democracies were sloppy, they're slow moving, um, they, they rely on consensus of one kind or another and that gives them a dis puts them at a disadvantage in competing against you know more uh, 
top-down system, in, again, in the short term. Uh, but the framers, what they believed is that the that ideas that were annealed in the furnace of debate and then rose to the level of policy in a combat or, a, you know, a, 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 in a clash of ideas, that those ideas would be much, which much better serve societies over the long and short term, and that that's where we would gain our advantage back. Um, that ideas that prevailed in a marketplace where there was heated debate would put us an advantage in, in, uh, in among governments in the world. Part of the reason why debates have been uh, floundering on campus and why we it's so important to have this institution, the Austin Union, and even established universities are now bringing back debate unions uh, or starting them for the first time, Harvard and Yale being examples. But part of the reason why there has been a resistance is students are saying that there are, even in law schools, that there are certain topics that are not debatable. There are certain perspectives that should not be aired. Uh, do you agree with that? Is it true that there are some ideas that should just be taken off the table and beyond the purview of debate? I don't think that. I, I think, you know, the First Amendment was written not for easy ideas. It was written for the ideas and the speech that nobody wanted to hear. It was written to protect things that embarrass people, that are awkward, that are um, that are abhorrent, that are appalling. You know, in 1978, as you know, the ACLU went to uh, bat for the Nazis to walk through Skokie, Illinois, which was a neighbor, a Jewish neighborhood, uh, where there were a tremendous number of Holocaust survivors. So it was, it was as offensive as you could get. But the ACLU and you know many liberals like myself supported that because the idea was that even though we all found what the Nazis were saying appalling and repulsive, we had to be willing to die for their right to say it. And you know I think that is a central tenet of democracy that you need, you need that free speech. You know, and during, the, during the Civil War, um, there, were, there were agents provocateur coming up from the South to, uh, to, to incite draft riots in the northern cities. And, Abra and it, was, it was damaging at a very, very tenuous time during the Civil War, it was damaging northern morale and union morale, the, the union almost collapsed at that point. And we had 60, 659,000 people die in that war. It's the equivalent of 7.2 million today. And, uh, and Abraham Lincoln suspended habeas corpus and started locking these people up before they did anything wrong. And that case went to the Supreme Court. The Chief Justice Roger Taney said that um, you can't do that. Even if the life of the nation is at stake, even if tens of thousands of people are going to die, you cannot suspend the Constitution. And I think that you know the free speech aspects of the Constitution, there they should be impervious to any kind of tampering. They, um, you know, that is the, there. There has never been a time in human history that we look back and say that the people who were censoring speech were the good guys. Yeah. They were always the bad guys. Yeah, and so, it's always because it's the beginning of a slippery slope toward totalitarianism. Well, I couldn't agree with you more about no idea being non-debatable. And one of my uh, free speech heroes made that point in his uh, famous book on liberty. So I, I want to show my favorite prop here, which uh, don't get excited or have heart attacks, respectfully, but respectively. What does it, it say, Bobby, for those who can't read it? Make J.S. Mill great Make again. Make J.S. Mill great again. <laughs> and um, as many of you know, there is a Mill Institute at the University of Austin, which is dedicated to promoting this kind of civil debate and discourse uh, among high school and middle school students, as well as among uh, college and university you know, I, students. I'd, I'd say one other thing, maybe, that 
you know, there is speech that that's abhorrent, that's mm -hmm. appalling, that's bad. Um, Louis Brandeis, who is the, uh, the Justice Supreme Court, mm -hmm. said that the remedy for bad speech is not censorship. The remedy for bad speech is more speech. And, yeah. I, and, I, and that is echoed in many, many judicial decisions by the Supreme Court, many of the other you know, mm -hmm. appellate courts, right. that that is always the remedy. Ex it's never shutting people up. Exactly. And, and that's why this notion of civil discourse is so important. And Bobby, you referred to two threats to it, which in some ways are counter to each other. You referred to cancel culture, which is this phenomenon that has led to such rampant self-censorship. We're seeing surveys that show, even on college campuses, uh, large numbers of students and faculty members are not even daring to discuss certain subjects at all or to air certain perspectives because they're afraid of unwittingly saying something that somebody sees as insensitive or offensive. So they're very concerned about civility. On the other hand, you alluded to the fact that we have a coarsening of public discourse where people are hurling epithets at each other as opposed to the kind of wonder, wonderful analytical discussion we saw in the inaugural debate here. So what is the problem? Are we being too concerned about civility or are we not being concerned about civility enough or both? Well, again, I, I am a free speech absolutist. I don't. I don't believe in cancel culture. I, I think we should talk to everybody. I've done that my whole life. You know, I was, during my 35 years that I was one of the leading environmentalists in the country, I was the only environmentalist who would go on Fox News, and I went on all the time. Because I think it's important for us to talk to each other. It's important for us to talk to people with whom we disagree. And it's important for us to develop the skills to challenge uh, abhorrent ideas yeah. Yeah. And, and let them prevail in the marketplace. Yeah. And you know that's what we need to do as a nation, and we need to be training our kids to do it, yeah. and we should not be silencing anybody. Great. Well, that's again what the Mill Institute and University of Austin is dedicated to. Uh, one of the difficulties in trying to have that kind of exchange on campus is that so many campuses are intellectual and ideological monocultures. There really is very little diversity of viewpoint. And one of the things that University of Austin is trying, is dedicated to doing, is to increasing intellectual pluralism. Um, many people have commented that there's a parallel problem in our political culture, that there's a danger of the two party, two major parties just creating some kind of echo chamber and not enough diversity of ideas within the political culture. Uh, what's your view about that? I would say that that's true. And I think uh, there is a tribalism that, you know, that pushes people into these orthodoxies and, and um, where it becomes almost a, a, a religious-like impulse to censor people, uh, to burn the heretics at the state, the people who venture outside of that um, narrow, uh, the, the narrow guardrails of each of the political parties to, be, uh, to become pariahs. And, and I, I believe that that uh, that the polarization that is now occurring in our country and, uh, and they, you know, that, there, that there's no kind of cross uh, pollination of, of ideas and that there's very few, you know, there, if there's a real penalty for crossing the aisle to the other political party. That these ideas become sacrosanct, that the first question you ask about a new bill or a new idea is who proposed it? And if it came from a Democrat and you're a Republican, you can't vote for it, or the other way around. And it, it, and all of that trajectory is amplified and accelerated by the social media, mm -hmm. which, um, which uh, preys on polarization, on rancor, on vitriol, and on, uh, and it, you know, keeps eyeballs. The, the way that it keeps eyeballs is by reinforcing people's worldviews. Well, you know, that's, uh, many critics have said, or not critics, observers, that that tends to be a phenomenon among all media. 
Uh, I assume you would not be supportive of some measures that have been proposed to uh, rein in the content moderation policies of social media platforms. Would you be in favor of government regulation and uh, construction? I, I don't. I think the. I think. Do you mean by this, like the state laws? Yeah. For example, the law in Texas and the law in Florida that the Supreme Court is now considering. Yeah. You know what? I haven't actually read those mm -hmm. laws, so I don't know because, uh, ironically, those laws themselves could be a form of censorship. Exactly. So, I oh, mean, but, the, the but, question but, is, are the platforms themselves exercising yeah. their editorial discretion? They may do so in ways that we don't like any more than we don't like the way the New York Times or Fox News or any other traditional medium is doing it. And the question is, you know, is the so-called cure worse than the disease? And if, if so, um, do you have other proposals for what could be done to improve the range of viewpoints and the access of alternative perspectives on social media platforms? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, just thinking about this issue for the first time, what I would oh. say is that I'm glad I, to put you on the spot. <laughs> I, I don't think the um, I don't think the social media platforms are probably entitled to the same kind of protection as a private publisher, mm -hmm. because the social media platforms are more they're they're more than publishers. They're they're actually platforms, and they have this special protection, Section mm -hmm. Two Thirty, mm -hmm. which um, which basically t says we're going to be neutral. You know, the, the, the Section 230, for those of you who don't know it, is that section of the Communications Act that protects uh, uh, social media platforms against defamation lawsuits by individuals who are defamed on the site. Uh, for example, I used to write a column uh, very often for the New York Times. Every time I wrote these op-ed pieces, the, uh, I would spend an hour or maybe two on the phone with lawyers who were going through every line to make, making sure that anything I said that was potentially defamatory was factually based. The, because an individual who got defamed by me and my article could not only sue me, they could sue the New York Times. Mm -hmm. and, and so the social media sites, you know, when they were, when they were emerging, said that we can't do that. We can't vet every post on our sites with lawyers because we, we won't have a business. And so they went to Congress and say, we're different than other publishers because we're just a platform. We're going to be completely neutral in anything that's posted on our site. And so, and that justified the Section 230 immunity. And so now if they're saying, well, actually, we should be protected like publishers, yeah. it's, uh, I'd have to think that through because I think there's more, you know, the government can require more of them, much more of them than they would have published. The government cannot tell a publisher. The New York Times can publish anything it wants. It can publish a lighter writer. It can, it can fire them. There is no control that the government should be exercising over it. But these sites, since they're given that immunity, that special power by the government, I think they have a special obligation to keep themselves open and not be censoring political speech, but I don't know yeah. what that would look yeah. like. I, I really appreciate your saying that you're thinking this through for the first time, and I have to say that people who have thought about it a lot are very conflicted because of the um, some of the factors that that you've that you've mentioned. Uh, the ba biggest beneficiaries of Section 230 immunity, which, by the way was a bipartisan bill, right? It was right. proposed by Christopher Cox and Ron Wyden. Interestingly enough, at a time when Congress was already deeply divided and polarized, and they were good friends, one an ardent Democrat, one an ardent Republican, and they said, look, let's work on an issue that is so new that the parties haven't yet crystallized and hardened their positions. And I thought that was such an interesting way to try to create across the aisle collaboration that resulted in Section 230, which benefits every single one of us who has the opportunity, unprecedented opportunity, to reach worldwide audiences. And I would be very 
leery about endangering that. But since we are talking about a lot of discontent that now for public... Uh, let, let me just say one other thing yeah. about that. There, there's a, you know, one way, I mean, and, and I'll answer your other yeah. question about how do you regulate them. One is there's a, there, there, there's a doctrine, you know, a legal doctrine that if you make yourself into the public square, mm -hmm. that you lose a lot of your ability to censor speech. There's a case that went to the Supreme Court where a private mall owner was inviting the public to come into the mall, and it, it became almost a public space. And so when Vietnam War protesters showed up there to protest, the mall owner said, we're going to throw you off. But the Supreme Court said, actually, you can't do that because you've made yourself a public space. And I think the same could be said of the social media sites, that they have made themselves a public space. And I guess ultimately, you can regulate them almost like a public utility. That, 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 and that's a very serious argument that even yeah. some libertarians are advocating. Let uh, me take. But, uh, let me just. With that, yeah. And I don't. I, yeah. I, I don't mean to hog this yeah. age, but I think the best um, solution or how to regulate the social media is to make them have uh, to, to make them reveal their algorithms and mm -hmm. make the algorithms transparent. Mm -hmm. and make it so that you can choose your own algorithm so that you know how you're being manipulated. So that, for example, you can choose... Or maybe you can escape manipulation altogether better. Well, yeah, you're, yeah. you're manipulating yeah. yourself. Right? Yeah, right. you're making your own, your own you're, freedom you're of say, choice, right? You're going to say you can <laughs> have an algorithm that will only give you conservative viewpoints or liberal viewpoints, but at least you know you're being manipulated. Whereas now... <laughs> No, they're feeding it to you and they're manipulating yeah. you yeah. for their own affairs. I think that's, that's a great approach, and actually it's the approach that's been advocated by cyber libertarians, that, you know, the analogy to the freedom of choice that we have in traditional media, uh, and that would be a viewpoint and content neutral approach that would allow each of us to uh, not only know, choose, be aware of, but to choose the feed, but also to have interoperability so we could have other software uh, that would be attached to the major platforms. If I could just make a plug for that famous case that you talked about, the shopping center case, it was an ACLU case, and I say it to the young people who are newly admitted to the University of Austin, they were high school students who were protesting against the Vietnam War who brought that case all the way to the Supreme Court and created this really important precedent. So it's a wonderful inspiration about exercising freedom of speech in a way that defends freedom of speech and creates those rights for not only young people, but all, all the rest of us oldsters as well. Uh, we're sort of running out of time, so I, I want to ask, uh, zero in on one type of controversial expression, Bobby, that um, you've been attacked about and it's been the basis for deplatforming, uh, and that is so-called disinformation and misinformation. There are many people who are arguing that, you know, democracy is jeopardized by social media carrying what they consider, what the platforms consider to be disinformation and misinformation. There are many others of us who argue that democracy would be imperiled by empowering government to put pressure on these social media companies to take off what the government is subjectively calling disinformation or misinformation. Uh, can you comment about that? What's it yeah, I mean, the government to... should not be able to tell, should, should not be able to control things that it calls disinformation, misinformation. I mean, my uh, situation is kind of a, is a good template for that because I, you know, I've been told that I'm a purveyor of misinformation, but nobody has ever pointed to a single post that I have made that is factually erroneous. Oh, every, you know, I have a big, probably the biggest, most robust fact-checking operation in the country, and we have 350 uh, PhD scientists, MD physicians on our on our uh, advisory board. And everything that I posted on Instagram and Facebook was cited in the source to, to peer-reviewed publications. 
There's a couple times, maybe twice, that we made errors and people immediately called them to our attention and our response to immediately correct it and apologize. And you can go and look up instances where we're doing that. We would not leave up something that we knew to be wrong or that was not supported by fact. And in fact, when the White House was pressuring Facebook and the other platforms to take down my post, they pushed back and said, what he's saying is not factually wrong. And so they made up a new word called malinformation, which is information that is accurate factually, but is nevertheless inconvenient for the government. And they began taking that down. So I think with, if the government has power to, to tell you, it's Orwellian. I mean, and all you have to read is, you know, 1984, Aldous Huxley, or, or um, you know, or any Robert Heinlein or George Kessler, any of these, you know, uh, people that we grew up, these classics about, you know, the emergence of totalitarian societies, um, they all claim to know what the truth is. And, but the truth is what's good for them. And that's the problem with government. If you give them that power, every government, every power that you give a government, it will ultimately abuse the maximum extent possible, conceivable. And, and every power that you give a government, it will never give back. So. And the U.S. Supreme Court said in striking down a law um, outlawing various kinds of lies that we have no need in this country for Orwell's Ministry of Truth. Right. Now, for free speech, we're turning it over to audience questions, which Ben is going to field. Um, Bobby, I was going to ask you about the connection between your position against central bank digital currency and free expression, how those relate to each other. Yeah, I mean, I saw that. I, I got, you know, my kids knew a lot about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, and I hadn't paid attention. They were, my, my kids were buying little bits of it, and I have seven kids uh, and six of them are between 20 and 30 years old so they were all, they're all part of that generation that had a you know great fascination with the emergence of bitcoin and they were very kind of early adopters and so i heard about it from them but i didn't pay much attention until i saw the trucker strike in canada and our organization, Children's Health Defense, had been following the trucker strike. The truckers in Canada were protesting the COVID mandates, some of the lockdowns, um, and you know, masking mandates, uh, vaccination mandates, and others. It's a very, very diverse group. A lot of them are Asian, Blacks, every color of the rainbow. They came, they started in Alberta, and they picked up thousands of trucks as they drove across Canada to Ottawa. And we had an embedded reporter with them. And so we were following them the whole time. And when they got to Ottawa to protest, they were trying to petition uh, Prime Minister uh, Trudeau. And they were doing, exercising a right that we all take for granted in this country. It was a right to assemble, the right to protest, right to petition their government. And uh, the government instead condemned them as right-wing fascists and racists, which if you look at the videos, they're the opposite. It looks like Woodstock. They were you know, delivering bottled water. They were cooking food for the poor. They were picking up garbage. They were, you know, there was musicians on every block. It was really a beautiful thing. The government used facial recognition systems and other intrusive technologies to identify the participants, the, all the truckers. They used, their, they got their license plates, et cetera. And then they froze their bank accounts. So they couldn't get diesel for their trucks. They couldn't uh, buy food for their kids. They couldn't pay for their education. They couldn't pay their mortgages. Uh, one trucker told me, and he was going to jail because he couldn't pay his alimony and he was under a court order to pay the alimony. It occurred to me then that transactional freedom is as important as freedom of the press because or freedom of speech. Because if you have freedom of speech in the, in the First Amendment and yet when you exercise that speech, the government doesn't like it, they can starve you to death, they can throw you out of your home because you can't pay your mortgage or your rent, uh, then that is meaningless. 
So transactional freedom is absolutely critical to freedom of speech, and you know that's why I've supported. If we get a central bank digital currency, they do what they do in China, where they have currency nowadays. You don't your currency is your face. So they you go into a a, a restaurant, you go into a grocery store, and you buy gasoline, and your face is your credit card. And if you and you, they keep a social credit score on you, so that if you don't, if you got your mask off or below your nose on a on a mass day, if you if you are not social distancing properly, if you violate some other social norm, you get penalties taken off your social media score, and at some point they punish you by closing by by making you by, by what they call programmable currency which is your face will only now work at grocery stores that are within a certain radius of your house. You can't buy gas, you can't buy an airplane ticket, you can't buy anything else. So you're basically under home confinement. Like the truckers in Canada, they were never charged with a crime. They were certainly never convicted. It was just they were doing something the government didn't like. Oh, the government was able to destroy their lives, and that is a very dangerous power to give government, and that's why I'm against central bank digital currencies, because that is part of the path to getting us where China is today. That's where they started. That's where all these other countries started with a central bank digital currency, and, uh, and it's the end of freedom. We will be slaves if we allow that to happen. You know, that concept of transactional freedom and its connection to freedom of speech, we have a case before the US Supreme Court that's raising that issue uh, from a somewhat different factual circumstance, but it comes from New York. Uh, it happens to directly involve the NRA, the National Rifle Association. The ACLU, I'm very proud, but with a great deal of controversy among its membership, is defending uh, the NRA because the government officials in New York State put pressure on banks and credit card companies and other financial services industry members not to do business with the NRA, which means that the NRA will not be able to exercise its First Amendment rights, freedom of association, and freedom of expression. And regardless of what your views are on gun issues, the larger issues are of individual freedom of speech and association. So it's a... Yeah, I mean, they make the inroads. Um, with an organization that, or with a controversy that everybody considers villainous, whether it's, you know, anti-vaxxers or, or, you know, in New York, gun nuts or whatever. And then they make the constitutional inroads, but then they begin applying it to the rest of us. So it used to be just, you know, people who complained about the COVID mandates were censored. Now, if you complain about Ukraine war, if you complain, there's a lot of other things that if you are if you try to talk about them, you're going to encounter censorship. And, uh, you know, this is, and, and by the way, they have, I've seen transcripts of conversations that, that Jamie Dimon had Right, with a, you say that the government pressured the banks to do that. The banks want to do this. You know, they see this as uh, as kind of the part of the social benefit that they can apply, that they can provide society in exchange for the huge amount of power that we've given them over our lives. And you know, they are thinking of ways of using bank regulations to punish people. And you know, it may be that the next thing they punish is pornography or punish people who are, you know, who do, um, who do, who do something in violation of, of climate. Well, in uh, a particular state, let's say Alabama, it might be Planned Parenthood that gets Or Planned punished. Parenthood, exactly. Other questions? Yes, sir, here in the hat, would you like to state your question? Good afternoon, Mr. Kennedy. My name is Garrett. I'm from Harlingen, Texas. Uh, my question is, what is your plan to combat Bill Gates and... Um, what is what? Your plan to combat Bill Gates from buying up farmland in uh, the United States. Well, I don't, I don't think I can uh, stop Bill Gates from buying farmland in the United States, but I... Um, I think, I mean, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of plans for ending the 
the corporate control over our, our food supply and over our, you know our farmland and the destruction of our soils. I'm going to reverse. Um, I'm going to reverse 80 years of farm policy in this country, which have directed us toward industrial agriculture, industrial meat production, factory farming, uh, the chemical agri chemical based agriculture, carbon based fertilizers, all of these things that are destroying the soils in our country. And I, you know, my career, I've been doing that my whole life. I've been I've sued uh, the USDA and and the big farm. Uh, Cabal's probably more than any other attorney in this country. I've sued Tyson, Cargill, Monsanto, uh, Smithfield, and uh, and on and on. And uh, and I, you know, all of the factory farming. I've 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 I brought probably over a hundred suits against factory farms in this country. But they're destroying this. This kind of farming is destroying the soils in our country. It's poisoning the food. Now, the process of food that they produce is not even food anymore, it's commodities. And most of it's going to processed food companies that are using a thousand ingredients that are all banned in Europe. And we have a chronic disease epidemic in this country that is being fed by processed food. Chronic disease, when my uncle was president, 6% of Americans had chronic disease. Today, 60% do. And you know our kids are getting buried by it. I I talk to young people all the time, and I and I hardly can meet one that doesn't have an autoimmune disease, doesn't have a neurological disease, reading disorders, learning disorders, ADD, ADHD, speech delay, language delay, tic, sleeping disorders, ASD, autism has gone from one in ten thousand in my generation, seventy-year-old men, <laughs> to one in thirty-four kids in my kids' generation. One in every 22 boys. Food allergies suddenly appeared around 1989. You know, I had 11 cousin, 11 brothers and sisters, about 70 first cousins, and none of them had a peanut allergy. Why do five of my seven kids have food allergies? Something is poisoning them. Why did uh, diabetes today? When I was a kid, a typical pediatrician would see one case of diabetes in his entire career, juvenile diabetes. Today, one out of every three kids who walks through his door has either pre-diabetic pre -diabetic or, or diabetic. Something's wrong. We're spending more just on diabetes than our entire military budget. OK, so and nobody's saying, why is this happening? And we know why it's happening. It's high fructose corn syrup. And it's, you know, glyphosate and, and neonicotinoids and atrazine and all the other crap that is in our food. We're not feeding people, we're poisoning them. There's a study that I read this week that showed that, uh, that girls who eat processed food are more, are 1,400% more likely to engage in violence than girls who do not. Oh, it, you know, this is a mental health issue, the depression, the anxiety, all of this stuff. The autoimmune diseases that our kids are now ubiquitous in that generate. Kids are not supposed to be sick like that. They're not supposed to be complaining of brain fog. They're not supposed to be on chronic on Adderall and, and albuterol inhalers and and you know, insulin and all this other stuff, that that is not what children are supposed to look like. And, and they don't look like that anywhere else in the world. Only here. We have the highest chronic disease rate on Earth. And we're being mass poisoned by our food. <clears throat> During COVID, we had 16% we had of the COVID deaths in the United States of America. We only have 4.2% of the world's population. We had the worst record of any country on earth. I don't know why people are getting awards for this. Because whatever they did was wrong. But CDC says, well, the reason it's not our fault, it wasn't mismanagement of COVID, it's because we have the sickest people on earth in this country. The fattest people on earth, the sickest people on earth are here. And they said the average person, this is what CDC says, the average person who died from COVID had 3.8 chronic diseases. So 
Oh, they had diabetes, they had obesity, they had asthma, and they had one other thing, right? No, no, that's what killed them. It was the chronic disease that took them to the top of the cliff and put them over the side, and uh, you know, and COVID just stepped on their fingers, you know, and dropped them. Oh, you know, that's what we need to start recognizing, and that's coming for food, and that's part of Bill Gates's plan. You know, to have us eating, you know, insects and chemical food. That's what he did to Africa with the Green Revolution. That, you know, it has put 30 million extra people into into um, into food insecurity, and we don't need them to do it here. How do you deal with not only misinformation but weak information? People who take true facts but misconstrue them. That could be the government. Could be an individual, could be an organization. How do you deal with weak evidence? I, well, you know, the, the, that's why we were given brains to, to figure that out. Okay. So, you know, again, I would repeat what, Bra what Louis Brandeis said, which is the remedy for bad speech is more speech. You know, if you read one video and you believe it and you're not going to exercise your capacity for critical thinking, you're not going to do extra research. Uh, then, you know, you kind of deserve what you get, right? Um, but I, I think most of us know that. I mean, I think the issue that you raise, I don't know how to uh, address it more than that because we're about to enter into the age of AI and the capacity for deceit on the internet for very, very convincing deceit, including, you know, I've seen these scientific studies that are created by AI that look very real and very convincing. And then, you know, when you actually start looking into their citations and tracking them down, they're just, they're nothing. And, you know, industry is already doing that. I mean, I don't like read one scientific study and say, oh, autism is being caused by vaccines. I had to read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies and look at both sides and look at the authors and look at the conflicts of interest and, and go into the weeds and not just read the abstracts, but to read, in many cases, the entire study. Oh, you know, that, that is unfortunately part of the duty of living in a democracy, is to exercise, to maintain a constant posture of skepticism toward any authority, and, and including scientific authorities. This whole idea that we heard during COVID of trust the experts, that's not a thing, right? That's not a thing. Trusting the experts is not a feature of either science or democracy. It's a feature of religion and totalitarianism. That's where that happens. To what do you attribute the reason an organization like the ACLU would most likely not allow a march like the Skokie, Illinois march today? Well, it's factually untrue, I'm uh, happy to say, because uh, a few years ago, the ACLU, which is, has no power to allow or disallow, but came to the defense of a march that the city of Charlottesville, Virginia, tried to disallow, namely the Unite the Right demonstration. Uh, the ACLU came to the defense of the free speech rights of the white supremacists there, just as we had done 50 years earlier in Skokie, despite deploring their message. Uh, we won in court, as we should have done, because at the time, there was absolutely no evidence that there would be any violence. The chief of police testified that they had monitored the situation. They were confident there would be no violence, that if there was violence, uh, it would be subject to police control. Uh, tragically, it turned out that there had not been adequate law enforcement preparation, which is why violence ensued. But I think at, based on the record at the time, the ACLU was correct and the court was correct to defend freedom even for the thought that we hate. I would say the ACLU dropped the ball during COVID you know, by not coming to 
the defense of people who are being censored, the doctors, the scientists, you know, the, the top scientists in this country, Jay Baktavia and, and many others who were uh, systematically censored and, uh, and by the government. So, uh, you know, I, I was very disappointed uh, at the ACLU during that era. I think it was a low point for the organization. I'm happy, though, that they're, they're back in the trenches fighting for free speech. Thank you so much to our distinguished guests here. Nadine, you've been such a good friend to the university in helping us guide where we're going in shaping our founding principles. I know that's work that you're going to continue. And Mr. Kennedy, sir, if nothing else, for the, the clear passion and dedication and care for the future of the young people in this country that you've shown tonight, we'd like to thank you sincerely for the contribution you've made here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.